Welcome to Bladed Tech Musings, the channel dedicated to retro tech, innovation, science, and technological entertainment. SpaceX's Dragon 2 Demo 2 manned spacecraft launches on May 30th, 2020. Barring any further launch window or technical readiness problems, from Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center. It is the United States' first manned space mission for American astronauts on an American spacecraft in nine years. For SpaceX, the launch represents an incredible technical achievement. In 2010, SpaceX not only did not have any experience in manned spaceflight, the company had not produced spacecraft of any kind. SpaceX's commercial cargo missions did not start until two years afterward. In just 10 years, SpaceX has designed, built, and produced both commercial cargo freighters and manned crew capsules certified for flight. SpaceX's achievement is in stark contrast with Boeing's Starliner Commercial Crew Development Program, which is slated to fly no earlier than 2021. This is despite A, Boeing's decades of experience in designing, building, and managing spacecraft, space facilities, and rockets, B, that the company received 75% more in funding than SpaceX, and C, the fact that Boeing had a one-year head start over SpaceX in funded development. We reviewed the competition between SpaceX and Boeing in making a commercial crew capsule reality in episode 30. A link to episode 30 can be found below. The very fact that there is a manned capsule program referred to as the Commercial Crew Development Program may spur some to think that there must be also a Government Crew Development Program behind one of the doors of a building in one of NASA's many facilities. And they would be right. That program is called the Orion Multipurpose Crew Vehicle and has been in the works since 2006, four years before the first Commercial Crew Development Study was awarded to Boeing. However, in spite of the fact that $20 billion has been spent on the Lockheed Martin-led program since inception, there has been no unmanned or manned missions undertaken for the production Orion spacecraft. While will SpaceX end up beating Lockheed Martin and its partners to manned spaceflight by at least a year? This outcome seems highly unlikely given the stupendous amount of time, in relative terms, money that the Lockheed Martin team was paid by NASA, the Orion program's five-year head start, the decades of experience in manned spaceflight, and the company's far longer relationship of working with NASA than at SpaceX. Let us take a look at NASA's struggle to replace the space shuttle, its decision to fund both commercial and federal manned space programs, and why SpaceX came out on top. The Space Shuttle Program, originally one of the objectives of NASA's Comprehensive Space Transportation System Plan of 1969, was initially funded in 1971. It was thought that the shuttle would be operational within five years, but technical problems related to its unique reusable ceramic tile heat shield and the design of a new three-rocket scheme for lifting the shuttle to orbit presented significant delays. As a result, the first Space Shuttle, the Enterprise, did not receive the necessary ceramic tile skin and thus was built solely to undergo glide testing. Even so, although construction on the Enterprise began in 1974, it still took three years to get it ready for testing in 1977. Despite a NASA decision to incur the incredible cost of constructing an entire prototype shuttle that would never be used for spaceflight, the time saved in doing so ended up being wasted. The second shuttle, Columbia, began construction in 1975 and took seven years to complete and conduct its shakedown launch in 1981. Thus, a space frame that was envisioned in 1969 not to be in service longer than 15 years, which would have been about 1990 in the originally conceived time frame, ended up flying until 2011. Substantial cost and schedule overruns meant that even though several dozen shuttles were originally called for by the STS plan, required to make a sustainable, full-utility long-term space station possible, only six were built, with just five of those being space-worthy. Even worse, the five operational shuttles were built over a 17-year period, necessitating repeated avionics and electronics upgrades of 40-year-old designs. Tragically, the extra time and money spent on engineering, program management, and mission turnaround time did not manifest in an improved safety record. Over the span of 135 missions, two of the five shuttles were destroyed in design-related accidents, killing 14 astronauts. Also problematic was the reality that shuttles flew at most four to five times per year. The original SDS plan had called for a shuttle flight every week. This isn't to say that the space shuttle wasn't an incredible engineering feat. It was, and still is. The shuttle also had great optics. 
was a marvel to watch, whether during launch, in orbit, or landing. It was like something out of a science fiction film brought to life. By many measures, the shuttle program was a resounding success. Unfortunately, by the yardstick used by the STS plan, the shuttle was a resounding failure. It took too long to develop, it cost too much to design, it took too long to turn around between missions, and it cost too much per mission. Costs were so mind-bogglingly high for the shuttle that NASA almost completely consumed its manned space budget on it for three decades, without much left over for space stations, other spacecraft, returning to the moon, or venturing out a little farther to Mars or Venus. As a result, when the shuttle was finally retired, NASA only had a few modules on the International Space Station and no replacement orbiter. At the beginning of the 21st century, it wasn't exactly a state secret that the end was near for the space shuttle. Nevertheless, the Clinton administration was perfectly happy to kick the can down the road to subsequent administrations. In 2004, the Bush administration requested that NASA explore options to replace the shuttle and its progenitor, the Space Transportation System. The answer to this request eventually became the Constellation Program, and contracts were awarded to Boeing and Reliant Tech Systems for a new rocket scheme and Lockheed Martin for a new spacecraft. The new spacecraft was dubbed the Orion. It was intended not to just replace the shuttle, but also serve as a deep space transporter like the Apollo capsule. Crewed Orion capsules were expected to venture to the moon by 2025 and Mars in the 2030s. Additionally, two different rockets, both called Ares, were being developed to replace the shuttle system, a single stack design for manned missions and a triple stack design derived from the shuttle system for freight. The expected budget for designing the spacecraft and the two rockets and launch a mission to the moon was to be well in excess of $200 billion. For comparison, the entire Apollo-Saturn program cost $150 billion in 2020 dollars during its run from 1961 to 1972. That's right, for those of you keeping score, the cost of merely repeating what was achieved in 1969 and duplicated several times in the three years after was going to be 33% more expensive and twice as long to complete despite substantial improvements in technology. By the time the Obama administration arrived on the scene, NASA had sunk several billion dollars into Constellation in five years with not much to show for it other than some blueprints, a prototype medium-duty rocket, and proposed schedule delays and funding increases. An in-depth review of the program in 2009 confirmed the administration's suspicions. The program was an expensive boondoggle that benefited no one outside of the contractors involved. Perhaps more importantly, Constellation would do little to advance NASA's manned space objectives during Obama's term in office, even assuming he won re-election in 2012. As a result, the Constellation program was killed effective fiscal year 2011, and NASA scrambled to come up with a new plan. That plan was dubbed the Space Launch System. The SLS plan was really just a rebadged version of the Constellation program. The new plan would continue to develop the Orion capsule and the Ares 5 heavy lift rocket, as well as include several lunar mission aspects that were brainstormed in the canceled program. The essential difference was that the medium duty Ares 1 rocket would be discontinued, while the Ares 5 freight rocket would be renamed the Space Launch System and realigned as the man rocket solution. But perhaps the most important distinction of the SLS plan was its amortization of program cost. Although a concerted effort was undertaken to slim down the bloated Constellation budget into something more manageable and cost-effective by reducing mission requirements and simplifying design, annual cost savings were largely achieved by reducing the program spend rate. Consequently, the total amount spent on the SLS plan from 2011 to 2020 has been about $40 billion, 20 for the rockets and 20 for Orion with a continual spend rate of about $4 billion per year, less than the annual cost of the canceled shuttle program. While the space shuttle program was winding down, something peculiar was happening in the space industry. The fact that Boeing, Lockheed Martin, and Northrop Grumman, the three dominant U.S. government contractors, hadn't done anything innovative in Earth-to-orbit space technology in decades and seemed grossly inefficient was not lost on the commercial business sector. 
There seemed to be a large business opportunity in all of this inefficiency, and a number of commercial startups were launched to take advantage. The cost of doing business in space hadn't exactly been lost on NASA either. Faced with continuously shrinking budgets year after year in real terms, the space agency looked for a way to hedge its bets on the big three. In 2006, with what was essentially budgetary pocket change, it gambled on a couple of those startups in a program it called Commercial Orbital Transportation Services. The big three sneered and blustered at the move, but NASA had already come to the conclusion that it needed a more cost-effective way to supply the ISS other than to use some of the few remaining shuttle flights available or via the Ares-5 rocket of the Constellation program. Thus, the agency awarded contracts to two promising companies. One company was Kistler Aerospace, a Northrop Grumman partner who proposed a reusable launch vehicle called the K-1, and the other was Space Exploration Technologies Corporation, soon to be better known as SpaceX, which proposed a new freighter that NASA would fund, and the Falcon 9 rocket, which the company would fund out of pocket. Kistler failed to meet the development cost objectives, but SpaceX was able to successfully launch its freight capsule demonstrator. This led to a follow-up contract for commercial resupply services to SpaceX in 2008. With the success of the Commercial Resupply Service Program, NASA decided to try the same with crewed launches. Called the Commercial Crew Development Program, Boeing was initially selected to develop a proposed design in 2010 and then continue its development in 2011. By this time, SpaceX owner Elon Musk had convinced NASA it could be a serious contender for manned spaceflight, so the agency awarded SpaceX a contract in the same year to begin development based on its Dragon freighter. In 2012, Boeing and SpaceX were awarded about a half a billion dollars each to continue development. With both hitting sufficient milestones, the two companies received a final award in 2014 of $4.2 billion and $2.4 billion, respectively, for development and production that would result in the first manned launch of a commercial crew capsule to the ISS. While this activity was going on, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, French aerospace conglomerate Airbus, and Northrop Grumman were soldiering on in the background on their $4 billion a year in funding for Orion and the SLS. Six years later, SpaceX is to conduct its historic first commercial manned launch of the Dragon 2. This was five years before the originally scheduled manned flight of Orion in the canceled Constellation program, one year earlier than the most recent space launch system schedule, and at least one year before Boeing could hope to certify its commercial Starliner capsule for manned spaceflight. So why did the Space Launch System program team, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, and Airbus, in spite of its historical, political, and funding advantage, fall behind SpaceX and the manned space replacement for the space shuttle? In short, it came down to design objectives and a space industry consolidated to the point of a lack of competitive alternatives. We will go over the design issue first. When the Orion was first proposed for the Constellation program, the capsule objectives were not just limited to replacing the space shuttle and visiting the ISS. The intent was for Orion to be a real replacement for the Apollo capsule, which was engineered to go to the moon. After all, the space shuttle was only ever intended to be an Earth-to-orbit vehicle per the Space Transportation System Master Plan. Deep space transport has a whole different set of challenges. For example, a moon-capable spacecraft has to carry enough fuel to reach lunar orbit and return. It also has to have enough cargo space in addition to the manned area to carry a lunar lander and lunar equipment. Long space flights require the spacecraft to be able to resist solar and space radiation, as well as manage the thermal challenges of being exposed to the sun constantly. Life support must be sufficiently robust to support weeks-long missions, and the communication suite has to be able to maintain a link over millions of miles of space, considerably more challenging than talking to Earth from orbit. Although Orion's empty mass at 21,000 pounds is about a third less than the Apollo command module, its volume is two and a half times greater. This additional volume is to accommodate the additional systems deemed necessary for deep space flight. Orion's actual pressurized habitable volume at 330 cubic feet is about the same as that of the Dragon 2 spacecraft. Orion is also designed to be mated to a deep space habitat for Mars missions to allow for the necessary additional crew, engineering, and scientific space needed for a long-duration spaceflight. SpaceX is designing a separate deep space craft, Starship, to take on deep space roles rather than extending the capability of the Dragon 2. It is certain that there were cost inefficiencies in moving from the original Constellation program to the Space Launch System plan. 
it is possible that the money spent during the entire period of 2005 to 2010, or about $6 billion, was essentially lost. Still, the additional $14 billion spent since then, and counting, is considerably in excess of the $3 billion NASA spent on SpaceX's Dragon 2. After SpaceX and Boeing were each awarded the original commercial crew development contract, Lockheed Martin recognized the competitive threat that the Dragon 2 and Starliner represented to the Orion program. The company went as far as to discuss a reduced cost variant of the Orion capsule with Bigelow Aerospace, which had been separately working on space station designs with NASA. Those discussions never materialized into anything concrete. Bigelow closed down its operations in March 2020 after the onset of the pandemic and is not expected to reopen. The Orion capsule is still only available in its deep space configuration. In 1969, the space industry was a crowded affair, full of large aerospace companies chasing the U.S. government's dollar. The list included Northrop, Grumman Aerospace, Westinghouse, General Dynamics, Raytheon, United Aircraft, Rockwell International, Collins Radio, Lockheed, Martin Marietta, Boeing, and McDonnell Douglas. However, the end of the Vietnam War in 1975 and the subsequent defense industry consolidation pushed by the U.S. Defense Department in order to simplify its supply chain, also accelerated consolidation in the space industry. By 1988, as the development of the space shuttle was beginning to wind down, half of the companies competing in the U.S. space business had been bought by their competitors. By 1999, after the fall of the Soviet Union and another round of consolidation, U.S. government spending on space missions was largely dominated by just three companies, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, and Northrop Grumman. In 2006, after the start of the Constellation program, further consolidation occurred when Boeing and Lockheed Martin teamed together on launch contracts in a joint venture called the United Launch Alliance. While industry consolidation vastly increased revenues and profits for the three surviving corporations, it also limited options for NASA. There was little incentive by Boeing and Lockheed Martin to innovate beyond the technology it had from the space shuttle program, and little incentive to hit scheduled milestones when it was essentially guaranteed funding regardless of NASA program objectives. Essentially, NASA was just an income stream for the big three, and despite their flag waving, U.S. national priorities and advancements in space exploration in general took a back seat to quarterly profit numbers. Boeing, Lockheed Martin, and Northrop Grumman's inefficient management structure built around corporate governance, program office profit centers, and program manager superstars also contributed to their problems with cost effectiveness and innovative inertia. We reviewed this issue in detail in episode 30. In effect, the visionaries that founded the predecessors of these three corporations have given way to professional managers, while 21st century commercial startups like SpaceX, Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic, and Rocket Lab are led by entrepreneurs not tethered to short-term performance and annual incentive packages. We're not diminishing Boeing, Lockheed Martin, and Northrop Grumman's tremendous achievements in important histories and manned and unmanned spaceflight. Much of what has been accomplished since the end of World War II in the U.S. space program is due to the hard-working employees past and present at these companies and their predecessors. Nevertheless, the space industry's return to a competitive and cost-effective space exploration focus will be significantly more beneficial to all involved. Do you agree with our assessment of SpaceX's Dragon 2, the Lockheed Martin-led Orion, and Boeing and Northrop Grumman Space Launch System? Share with us by dropping a comment below. We hope you enjoyed this briefing on the NASA Commercial Crew Development Program's success on beating their own primary plan and getting a spacecraft certified for manned spaceflight. If so, click the like button. We would like to take a moment to thank our subscribers for helping us reach the 2000 subscriber milestone. Not a subscriber yet? Clicking the subscribe button and the bell notification icon will help both our YouTube standing and keep you informed when new episodes are released. Links to previous space industry related episodes and our other content can be found below. Stay connected by occasionally checking our Instagram feed where we post content from upcoming episodes and from episodes past that you may have missed. Make sure you follow our Twitter account where all new episodes are announced. And finally, join us on our Facebook page 
where we cover current news and events related to channel content. Thanks for watching.